Greetings and welcome to an LGR thing. And today's thing is a bit of a strange one, at least from today's point of view. This is the Kodak Display Maker Video Graphics System, sold for $1,995 in 1988 by the Eastman Kodak Company. And it is effectively a PC-like computer system that doesn't run DOS, but instead is 100% committed to producing and displaying graphical slideshow presentations. Yeah, kind of like PowerPoint, but in dedicated hardware form. That's all this thing does. It was recently donated to me by an LGR viewer named Paul who found it at a Goodwill thrift store for 10 bucks, seemingly unused. You gotta wonder how a device like this ends up not being used for over 30 years and eventually ends up on my table because this thing wasn't exactly a cheap consumer device. As described on the packaging, the main sector Kodak was aiming to please was the business, sales, engineering, and educational markets. The whole idea was that the display maker could act as a digital alternative to otherwise analog presentations, augmenting or replacing the old methods of overhead projector transparencies or making 35mm slides for use in a carousel slide projector. And seeing as it was meant to be used with TVs, computer monitors, and projectors, it could even be used as digital signage, something to be set up in a store window or wherever your business needed an automated display. So why didn't it take off? After all, I know I'd never heard of it, and information online is scarce at best. Well, being that this is a digital Kodak device, it's no surprise that their timing and execution were both a bit off. By 1988, the display maker was just one device among several computerized presentation options on the market. As one employee of Audiovisual Systems put it, the display maker was known to them as the poor man's video show. He doesn't recall them ever actually selling one, and potential clients who weren't comfortable with computers didn't want anything to do with it. So what was the video show, you may ask? Well, that was the premier automated graphical slideshow presentation system of its day, having been introduced by General Parametrics in 1984. The Video Show 160 was on the market by 1988, competing directly against the display maker, and it outperformed it in nearly every way. More features, higher resolution, greater support, and an advertising campaign featuring the praises of companies like Reader's Digest, Pfizer, and Charles Schwab. Granted, it cost over twice as much at $4,595, but either way, the Kodak display maker seemed like a real compromise by comparison. Kodak didn't even really seem to advertise it directly, beyond a press release or two when it first launched. Mostly they just mentioned it in passing alongside other devices, like the LC500 video projector system. Combine all of that with PowerPoint having hit the market in 1987 and ballooning in popularity, alongside a multitude of desktop presentation graphics programs and compact in-office film printers, and Kodak's display maker hardware never had a great chance at success. To make his presentations more interesting, he starts out drawing his ideas by hand, then he uses presentation graphics software like PowerPoint to create the graphics and text on his computer. Then, instead of going out to a service bureau to prepare slides, Dr. Markison prints his computer graphics directly onto film with a Miris film printer. However, that makes this thing all the more fascinating to me because now that I know it exists and barely anyone's heard of it, I can't wait to dive in and see what it can do. As mentioned earlier, this particular example does not appear to have been used before, although it's definitely been opened and rifled through over the years. The main way you can tell is because of the way it is, with many of the key components like floppy disks and cables still being sealed and even stuck to the packaging. But yeah, you get a beefy spiral-bound manual with a quartet of high-density 5 and a quarter inch floppy disks, an infrared remote control for controlling the system remotely using a wavelength just greater than that of the red end of the visible light spectrum, the system itself, which we'll get to momentarily, a composite video cable, and a standard IEC power cable. And a light blue Kodak registration card that rewards you with a free fling camera. Ooh, a value of $695. It even comes with a set of four AAA batteries tucked away inside the styrofoam inserts here. Surprise, surprise, they've all started leaking, but oh well. Still need to see these late 80s Kodak Extra Life batteries. Anyone else kind of like old batteries? I don't know, I just think they're neat. Finally, we've got the display maker itself. A tidy looking system weighing in at 8 pounds and measuring 11 and a quarter by 10 and a quarter by 3 and a quarter inches. It's got a colorful 64 key QWERTY keyboard on top and a 1.2 megabyte 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk drive on the front beside the infrared receiver. 
The personal computer similarities continue around back. Starting on the bottom right, there's the power connector, a satisfying red power switch, an RF video output port, composite video out, RGB TTL video out for connecting it to a CGA compatible monitor, an RGB analog output for connecting to displays using SCART or BNC sockets, and two ports that aren't used normally. The RS-232 serial port is for connecting an optional serial printer or the Kodak DisplayMaker graphics tablet, and the Video Audio In port is for using the DisplayMaker video capture interface, allowing you to digitize still video frames. Along the bottom, there's not much to see, though you do get this little pull-out stand to prop the machine up at an angle. Feels ridiculously flimsy, though. Can't say I'll be using that. Speaking of flimsy, this keyboard is absolutely awful. <laughs> I mean, that should be no surprise, just look at the thing. It reminds me of the keys on a Mattel Aquarius or a Timex Sinclair 2068. Tiny little plasticky things that barely move, squishing down against a stiff rubber membrane that feels like garbage. Yeah, it's no wonder Kodak also sold an additional wireless keyboard accessory with better keys, because this is not ideal. Going through the manual, it looks like the setup process is super simple. It really does seem similar to a mid-80s PC compatible. But man, I am really glad this thing came with all the documentation too, because after the initial setup, there's a whole crapload of commands and settings that I don't know how long it would have taken me to figure out otherwise. But yeah, the video cable that comes with is for composite output with RCA on one end and a BNC connection on the other. They also included a handy little F-Type adapter for using the same cable with the TV's RF connection, so that's nice. We're not going to be using any of that, though, because this is LGR, and I have far too many awesome monitors to stick with composite video. For this, I'm going with the classic IBM 5154 Enhanced Color Display, which is an EGA-compatible screen that'll work nicely with the DisplayMaker's digital TTL output. So, the monitor cable goes in right there, power cable goes next to that, and using this handy monitor stand, the whole thing slides neatly underneath the CRT, leaving the keyboard and disk drive exposed. I love it! All right, it's finally time to get it all powered on and start presenting some presentations. Oh yeah, we got an error message. A good one, though. This is simply asking for a boot disk. Yep, just like earlier DOS PCs, the Display Maker does not have a hard drive or any kind of ROM to boot from, and instead relies completely on floppy disks to function. And with that in place, oh, <laughs> just look at it. I love that gaudy intro screen. It's the perfect blend of retro appeal and 80s cheese. Welcome to the Display Maker introductory disk. So yeah, we're running the demonstration disk right here, which takes you through a variety of sample slides showing off what the system can do and the basics of presentation. Things like how to use the remote control to navigate slideshows and enabling the on-screen pointer. Anyway, the rest of the demo disk is just a bunch of slides demoing what the thing can do. And dang it, this stuff makes me happier than it should. I know it's only a bunch of 16 color static imagery, mostly line drawings and low-res artwork, but ah, look at how cool it looks! Razor-sharp pixels and vibrant colors and graphs. So many graphs! It even has a slide demonstrating the capabilities of the optional capture device, which I mean, that's pretty sweet for 1988. I've got a computer eyes device that produces similar results I need to show off sometime. Anyway, moving on to the master disk now, which is where all the actual productivity happens. And the first order of business is to format a work disk, so you're not overwriting the master disk. What this does is blanks out a floppy and writes back the entire master disk to it, so that way you have the actual software and the storage for your projects all in one spot. This was the main appeal of the Display Maker. The fact that you'd get a complete package of hardware and software that could both generate and display slideshows without requiring a separate personal computer. As opposed to, say, the video show where you needed a PC to run software that could generate slides to be loaded onto a floppy disk and transferred to the video show afterward. But the Display Maker, that does it all in one spot. Both to its advantage and to its detriment. <laughs> you see, creating absolutely anything at all on this dreadful keyboard with this clunky software is an experience I do not wish upon anyone. An IBM Model M, this is not. I assume this would be improved using the Kodak drawing pad and external keyboard, but as it is by default, it's not great. And yes, I also tried a serial mouse to see if it supported that, but nope, no such luck. And that's only the hardware side of things, there's also the software itself. I've got plenty of experience with 80s productivity packages from Lotus 123 to Print Shop Deluxe and whatever else, but this Display Maker suite is a nightmare by comparison. Sure, you're given a ton of freedom to create most anything you want, from filled shapes to line drawings to text boxes, all with 16 colors to choose from. 
but placing any of it is slow and cumbersome, not to mention unintuitive as nuts. The manual includes tutorials, but there's still a steep learning curve in understanding which keyboard keys perform what function, the context of each key doing what it's supposed to, and the menus and screens that allow for specific functions. And much of that is not stated on screen at all, so it's a matter of constantly referencing the manual until you learn the routines by repetition. And it's not always consistent in the keys used either. Sometimes the return key enables a tool or menu, sometimes it's the select key, then it's the space bar, other times it's none of the above and it's the menu key. Then there's the chart creation tools, and oh boy. Once again, it's not clear at all what you have to press in order to get to the next menu, and even reading the manual I still found myself brute forcing my way through in order to get some variables it actually knew what to do with. Ah well, eventually I got the hang of everything. Between the finicky menu system, the lack of on-screen button context prompts, and the keyboard itself feeling like a rejected play school toy, it ended up taking about an hour to create two slides. <laughs> Once you do get some slides made, though, referred to as displays, they have to be written to a projection disk in order to be shown off with the remote and stuff. It then slowly renders your display files as static slides and writes them to the projection disk. Boot that disk up and there you go! You've got a display you can manually flip through or set it to automatically play on repeat. Fun! Was it worth it? <laughs> Apparently not, since pretty much no one bought these things, it seems. Still, though, I find the display maker immensely fascinating with its colorful low-res graphics and PC-like operation. Speaking of which, let's open her up and see what's going on inside. With a handful of rather long bolts out of the way, it's easy to access the internals. The bottom half contains the power supply and the disk drive, the latter of which is a standard Shinon FZ506 commonly found on clone PCs. The main board is clamped to the top half of the case underneath the keyboard, packing a bunch of familiar stuff if you're into 80s PCs. For one thing, the CPU is an Intel 8088 2. I'm not sure of the speed here, but when Tandy used them, the 1000SX and HX computers, they were 7.16 MHz. There's also a Western Digital WD2793A PL disk controller chip, again commonplace on PCs past the XT era. And then there's this lovely looking golden ceramic chip, an NEC D7220. This is the system's graphics display controller and is the same chip used in computers like the NEC PC8801 and the Epson QX10, among others. As far as the amount of RAM in here, it's obviously enough to keep the Display Maker software loaded, at least 512K, judging by the number of DRAM chips. And in case you're wondering, no, it does not run DOS. I tried both PC DOS 3.3 and MS DOS 5 with no luck, meaning that despite appearances, it is not actually a PC clone or even MS DOS compatible out of the box. Likewise, the disks themselves aren't readable on a PC, only showing disk formatting prompts whenever looked at on DOS or Windows environments. Bit of a shame, but alas, that's about it for the display maker. It's just like a PC, but it's not. It was super useful, except when it was a pain to use, and it's yet another Kodak device that was too little too late to make much of an impact because other products were already doing it better by the time it hit the market. At the same time, though, I think this thing is kind of awesome in a nostalgically blind way. And despite the keyboard being painful to use, it certainly gives it a unique aesthetic. I do wonder if modifications it could run PC software, but yeah, that's it for this video, and I hope you enjoyed this look back at a bit of retro computing tech. If you did, then LGR's the place for you. I've got a bunch of related stuff I've covered already and have plenty more to come in the future with new videos every week. And as always, thank you very much for watching.